finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Note how very similar the scripture reading of Hebrews 8 and Jeremiah 31 are. The reason is that, in Hebrews, Paul is quoting Jeremiah directly. Both passages refer to a new covenant. Jeremiah lived in the 7th century BC. The covenant is not as new as many in Christendom posit. Let's set some historical context for the old covenant. 1500 BC, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, there they remained because the, the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full, that is, the Amorite probation was not closed. When the sins of Canaan and their kind were at the high water mark, the Lord raised up a deliverer in Moses. Christ appeared to Moses in the burning bush directly and gave him the charge of leading his people out of Egypt. The Lord led them out of Egypt by a mighty hand. But being among the heathen for four hundred years took its toll. Israel forgot the law of God. Christ gave Moses a system of ceremonies and rites, with the strict purpose of teaching the value of the Son of God giving his life for the sins of the world. Prior to arriving at Sinai, the Lord used the giving of manna to re-establish the weekly cycle and the Sabbath. Each day, the Jews had to get up at daybreak to gather the manna off the ground. On the sixth day, Israel had to gather twice as much, for the next day, the seventh day, the Sabbath of the Lord. Being stiff-necked, they disobeyed the word of the Lord, and when they went out on the seventh day to gather manna, there was none. They violated God's Sabbath and aroused His anger. Exodus 16 verses 28 to 30, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days, abide ye every man in his place, let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Note Exodus 16 refers the breaking of the law, God didn't write the Ten Commandments on stone as yet. The law existed before Sinai. Exodus 20, God set the mountain on fire and called Moses up to the mount. There, God wrote his law on two tables of stone, on stone to indicate perpetuity. Moses placed these stones inside the ark. We may consider the writing of the law on tables of stone as righteousness for dummies. God had to state explicitly what it means to love God, the first four commandments, and what it means to love each other, the last six. In addition to writing to moral law on stone, the Lord gave Moses a system of rites and ceremonies that served as a type or symbol of what the Son of God would accomplish by dying on the cross. The mention of the ceremonial law should begin to spring thoughts in your mind as to what the Old Covenant was. The Jews were given the gospel in the form of a ceremonial law. They were to teach their children and evangelize the nations on earth. 
But alas, they failed miserably. They became bigoted, rebellious, idolatrous and completely disobeyed God's law. The deeper the slide into apostasy, the more fervent was the Lord's plea. Jeremiah 3 verse 14 Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. It is in this climate of adultery, this climate of apostasy. At one of Israel's most sinful state the Lord created a new covenant, before Israel was led into Babylonian captivity. Now let's get back to Hebrews 8 and we'll look at verse 1. Many who mimic popular preachers and take Hebrews 8 verses 8 to 12 out of context fail to consider the context or subject of Hebrews 8. Verse 1, Now of the things which we have spoken this is the sum, we have such an high priest, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Verse 1 provides the context of the chapter. Also, what is this sum or summary Paul speaks of in the text? Hebrews 4, begins with an affirmation that the Sabbath has not been changed. From approximately the midpoint of chapter 4 to the end of chapter 7, Paul presents his thesis as to why Jesus is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Chapter 8, Paul is ready to summarize Christ's role as our high priest before he shift gears to the Lord's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, as seen in chapter 9. Back to chapter 8 verse 1. We have an high priest on the right of God. Recall, David in the Spirit, Psalms 110 verse 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Verse 4, The Lord hath sworn, and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I hope you appreciate the beauty and symmetry of scripture, herein, Paul refers David. In our scriptural basis, Paul expands on Christ's role as our high priest. This is the subject and context in which the new covenant is to be understood. Paul quotes Jeremiah 31 directly in Hebrews 8 verse 8 to 11. Hebrews 8 verse 10, Paul continuing to quote Jeremiah writes, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind, and write them in their hearts. God will write the law in their hearts, in their minds, he is not destroying or outmoding the law. God is not abolishing or cancelling the law, making it relevant. No, text states emphatically that under the terms of the new covenant, God writes the law on our hearts, in the recesses of our minds. In the Bible, the compact that is called in scripture the old covenant was formed between God and Israel at Sinai, and was then ratified by the blood of a sacrifice, a sacrificial system. Recall, the sinner must shed the blood of the animal himself. The Abrahamic covenant was ratified by the blood of Christ, and it is called the second, or new, covenant. The first or old covenant was necessary because in their bondage, Abraham's seed had to a great extent lost the knowledge of God. The sacrificial system was designed to teach them of Christ. The new covenant was established upon better promises, the promise of forgiveness of sins and of the grace of God to renew the heart and bring it into harmony with the principles of God's law. The same law that was engraved upon the tables of stone is written by the Holy Spirit upon the tables of the heart. Instead of going about to establish our own righteousness we accept the righteousness of Christ. His blood atones for our sins. His obedience is accepted for us and when the penitent approaches the throne, the Father accepts the merits of Christ on the sinner's behalf. But note, the obedience to God's law is evidence that the law of God is in your heart, the new covenant. The law is not dispensed with, it is not done away with. We know that the law cannot save you but you are not going to be saved without it. Obedience to the law is a prerequisite to entering heaven and gaining eternal life. Revelation 22 verse 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. You cannot enter heaven by being disobedient. You cannot enter heaven by willfully breaking or disobeying God's law. The new covenant is not a license for disobedience. Revelation chapter 22 verse 14 is crystal clear. It is painful to see the callousness towards God's law and the wanton disobedience in the body of believers that profess Christianity. Many in Christendom, being disobedient, hate the law and look for excuses, using the new covenant in an attempt to outmode God's holy law. In Christendom, the buzzword has become, we are not under the law but under grace, which is a misapplication of Romans 6 verse 14. They omit verse 15 which reads, What then? Shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. In other words, now that we are under grace, grace is not a license to commit sin. 
God forbid or outlaws the mindset that thinks that grace is a licensure for sin. But what is sin? 1 John 3 verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression, or breaking, of the law. That is the definition of sin. Sin is the breaking of or the failure to obey the law. Romans 3 verse 23, wherein Paul refers David, For all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. We are all sinners, we have all broken God's law. But Paul also says that we are not under the law, what does that mean? Context, context, we revisit Romans 6 verses 1 and 2. Paul states emphatically, now that there is grace, we don't have a license to sin, to break God's law. Rather, we must be dead, apothesco in Greek, which also means to die off, a continuous process, that is, we ought to die daily to sin. The man that is dying daily to sin, is an obedient man. Since sin is defined by breaking God's law, the man that is dead to sin obeys God's law, thus, he is not under, the condemnation, the condemnation, of the law. But even though the obedient man is dead to sin, he is still under the law's jurisdiction, its jurisdiction or control. In that, once he sins, he breaks the law and is immediately under the law's condemnation. Hence under the new covenant, if the sinner, who is God's law written in his heart, runs back to Christ the source of righteousness, forgiveness and grace is assured, guaranteed. The grace and forgiveness that the new covenant affords releases the obedient, repentant sinner, I say the repentant sinner, from the condemnation of the law. He is not required to bring a lamb as a sin offering because Christ is the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. The obedient brings the requirements of Christ into his practical life. There is full assurance of hope in believing every word of Christ, believing in him, being united to him by living faith, faithfulness and obedience. The obedience to God's law is evidence that the law of God is in your heart, the new covenant. It is the trickery of Satan that the death of Christ brought in grace to take the place of the law. The death of Jesus did not change or annul, or lessen in the slightest degree, the law of Ten Commandments. That precious grace offered to men through a Savior's blood, establishes the law of God. If the law could be changed then Christ would not have to die. Christians should make Christ's death on the cross a matter of study. If this is done, we will no longer use the new covenant as a basis or excuse for antinomianism, an excuse for lawlessness. I have perused the subject of the law and many will say, this is legalism, far from it. Let's be clear. The law is not meant to save you. We don't keep the law to be saved. Psalms 103 verse 20, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, angels that dwell in heaven, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Angels who have, never sinned, God's holy angels obey the law of God. But how? The fifth commandment refers to honoring father and mother, angels don't have mothers and fathers. As stated before, the Ten Commandments are righteousness for dummies. God's law is based on two principles, law for God and love for each other. We have fallen so far that we have no idea what love for God and love each other means. Hence, Christ must write the principles in stone as Ten Commandments so that we, sinful folk, can understand what it really means to love God with all our hearts and our neighbor as ourselves. Sinless angels obey God's law in that they love God, principle number one, and they love each other, principle number two. David shows that angels without sin obeying God's law to drive home the point that the obedience to God's law is not just for sinners. By way of an analog, an apple tree doesn't bear apples to prove that it is an apple tree. No, it bears apples because it is an apple tree. So it is with those who are under grace, the obedient. Under the auspices of the new covenant, that is, when God writes the law in our minds, in our hearts, the Holy Spirit transforms the life and obedience or keeping God's law as a natural manifestation of our love for Christ. Obeying God's law is as natural as an apple tree bearing apples. John 14 verse 15, If ye love me keep my commandments. The Ten Commandments are grievous to the soul that doesn't love Christ. Purported Christians use Paul's re-emphasis of the New Covenant, which Jeremiah wrote in the 7th century BC, to support lawlessness, disobedience. The devil has deceived many into thinking that since Christ died and grace is available then we are no longer obligated to obey God's law. The disobedient falls for this lie in the light of the fact that sin is the breaking or failing to obey God's law, the same law they are unwilling to obey. However, those who humble their hearts, confessing their sins, will find mercy and grace and assurance. 
The new covenant guarantees this. Those who have God's law written in the heart will obey God rather than men. They will sooner disobey all man-made laws and earthly traditions. They will not then deviate in the least from the commandment of the God. God's people, taught by the inspiration of truth, and led by a good conscience will live by every word of God, of God not the pastor. They will take God's law, God's law, written in their hearts, as the only authority which they can acknowledge or consent to obey. The wisdom and authority of the divine law are supreme. In mercy God seeks to lead the unrighteous to repentance. The obedient will delight in the law of the Lord. And under the terms of the new covenant, God puts his laws in their minds, and writes them in their hearts. Their lives depict the presence of Christ their Savior.